Well, good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord today. David said, I was glad when he said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So whether you're joining us in person or joining us online, how many of you are glad to be worshiping by whatever means necessary today? Can we stand together? Come on, as you stand, why don't we give the Lord an ovation of praise and hallelujah. Let's worship today.
worthy. Today is Baptism Sunday, and we celebrate those who are going public with their faith, and it is going to be an exciting day. And I'm just thankful for his amazing grace that provides us with the opportunity to be restored. If you are being baptized today, uh, you should already possibly be in Roberts Hall, but if you're not, uh, we invite you to go there at, that time, at this time to get ready. I just want to read a passage of scripture. It just talks about how worthy God is. In Revelation 5.12, it says this, In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. He deserves all of those things from us today and more. How many of you know he is worthy of our praise today? Can we just lift up holy hands all across this house and just give honor to whom honor is due? Just say thank you, God, for everything that you've done for me this morning. Hallelujah. God, we worship today. You're worthy of the
you believe he's a worthy lamb, why don't you clap your hands and shout amen. Clap your hands and shout amen with us today. Amen, amen, and amen. Remain standing. We got more worship uh, to do. I know I'm here earlier than uh, I'm normally here in the service, and I, I really intended, uh, after I preached in the parking lot, I intended to go home and, and put a suit on this morning, but I'm telling you, I preached out there, and I preached up a lather. It's hot outside. Uh, it, it, it was hotter out there than when we quit doing that uh, some time ago. So forgive me, I just threw on a sports jacket over my Vol shirt, and, and we're here representing uh, today, and we're going to have good church. We, we, we had a great service uh, in the parking lot this morning. I got, I got a little discouraged. I got a little discouraged at first this morning. I, I, I woke up early. I went to bed last night not being fully prepared to preach to you. Uh, this morning, and I had my alarm clock set for five o'clock to get up and finish my preparation. And I got up and finished my preparation and got ready, came by the office, did a few things, went down to the parking lot, and I was pacing the parking lot, ready for the people to get there at about 12 minutes after eight. And about 8.15, I thought, I can't believe nobody's here. And 8.20, no one was there. And 8.25, no one was there. And I was there ready to preach at 8.30, and there was still no one in the parking lot at 8.30. And I thought, we're starting at 9.30, not at 8.30. And so they, th th they did come on in, and we had over 100 people uh, in the parking lot in the early morning service. And so we're glad uh, to make that available to them. And that also gives us a little extra safe room uh, in this service. Uh, so we're glad that you're here this morning. We want God to minister uh, to you in a rich and wonderful way. And it's my prayer you won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. If you worship here on a regular basis, we're honored to have you. If you're a visitor, we're so thrilled uh, that you're in the building. I, I see we've got some, some Texas people in the building with us. We've got the extended, we have the extended Moody family uh, with us today as Blake and Ashley got married last night. Would you give the Moody family a hand? Tell them you're glad to have them in the house of the Lord with us today. We're thrilled to have you and glad you made uh, the journey. Listen, we, we, we've got a special treat this morning. I'm going to be stepping out as the worship team leads you in a few more songs of worship, and I'll be baptizing a few people in just a moment. It's a great day as they go public with their professions of faith. I want you to celebrate with them as we baptize. Worship the Lord with Pastor Josh this morning. Bless your name today. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. God, you are worthy of our praise. It was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died.
with our baptistry uh, and our heater has not came on this morning and we are going to baptize them in chilly ice cold water so I, I told brother Steve when I got here this morning I said I see we didn't get that heater fixed and going I said get some boiling water and throw it in there and knock the chill out and uh, if he threw some boiling water in here it didn't knock the chill out <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you right now there they're sure to remember this all the days of their life. Amen. How many is thankful that people are making decisions to serve the Lord? I'm thankful for it. Haley, have you asked Jesus to come and forgive you of your sins? Do you love Jesus? And, 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 and short of church, you ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins, and you believe you did? I'm convinced, you know, are you going to serve the Lord all the days of your life? All right, let me take your glasses. Absolutely amazing. That's absolutely amazing. 
We're excited about what God's doing in your life, and it's our privilege today to baptize you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. South kids in all of the world. And uh, of course, she's this is the only church she's ever known. She was here before I was, and she captured my heart early in life. And if there's anyone in the South that I know loves me, I know this one right here loves me. Do you love Jesus? Are you are you gonna be a daughter of his all the days of your life? You're gonna serve him. God's got great things for you to do, and I'm looking forward to having a front seat watching God bless you and be with you. Upon your profession of faith, it's our privilege to baptize you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. She practically baptized herself. I mean, that was just, she just went down there with me. I kind of I felt unnecessary there, Joel. I mean, she just... Chills my body, but not my soul. <laughs> I'm excited about what God's doing in Mason's life. Mason's made a fresh commitment to follow him. Just believing God's going to do great things in your life. And listen, I'm telling you, he's got purposes and plans for you. High callings, the likes of which you still know nothing about. And I'm looking forward to having a front row seat at watching God bless your life for his displeasure. No, thank you. Mason, upon your profession of faith, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the sweet Holy Ghost. Woo! Right, this, is, this is Daniel. He's new to the 180 Center. Been here several weeks. Give him a hand. Tell him welcome to South Cleveland. He's from Dallas. He's from Dallas, Texas. And God's got great things for his life. God's going to help him supernaturally and make ways for him where there seem to be none. Daniel, is it your profession today that you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins? It is. You believe he's done that? Yes, I am. Upon your profession of faith, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the sweet Holy Ghost. fresh decision to follow Jesus? Yes, sir. You're going to follow him all the days of your life? Yes, sir. I'm convinced he's got great things for you. Step forward, please. Michael, upon your profession of faith, it's my privilege to be your pastor. And today I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the sweet Holy Ghost. Marcus, let me tell you something, church. It, it takes you being a minister where you go in your daily affairs for the great commission to be fulfilled. It, it takes you being a minister everywhere you go for the great commission to be fulfilled. The, the Bible says you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that it may give light to all that are there in the house. Therefore, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 4, 5, and 6, 
that you and I are to be careful how we act around outsiders and that we're to make the most of every opportunity, letting our communication be filled with grace and seasoned with salt that we may know how to answer everyone. You have to be a personal soul winner. It, it, it takes each one of us winning people to Jesus for us to make a difference in, in, in this community and in this life. I've been a pastor for 30 years, and, and I've, I've known many, many great godly people, but, but I don't think I've ever seen anyone do a more diligent job of making sure that they were intentional about bringing people into the faith than, than Deacon Tim Sounds does. He, he is light that is seen, and he is salt that is tasted. He, he constantly is inviting people to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And Tim came across uh, Marcus's path, has been ministering to him, called me, said, I got a gentleman that's uh, been struggling, had some life issues, had some long-time addiction trouble, and, 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 and some heartaches in life. Want to know if he's coming to the 180 Center? I met with him. He's been here now how long? Ten days. Been here 10 days, clean and sober, on his way. Somebody yeah. shout amen. That's good. That's good. That's good. You, you, you've got to make a difference in people's lives. You, you need to be able to point at people and say, that person wouldn't be in the kingdom had I not allowed God to use me. And if you can't point to somebody right now in your life and say that, I want you to make up your mind by the end of the year. You're going to be able to point to people and say, that person wouldn't be in the kingdom had God not used me. Marcus, I'm excited that you're here. I'm looking for God doing great things in your life. Squeeze your nose. Marcus, upon your profession of faith, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the sweet Holy Ghost. Woo! Thank you. Woo! Oh, somebody clap your hands and shout amen. Amen. Worship with them, and I'm going to be out there to preach to you in just a moment. What a blessing it is to be here. Are you glad you've already come this morning? I know I am. This is life right here. This is life. Isn't it good to know that you've come to a church where lives are being forever changed? And this is what it signifies to us. Every time we see someone be baptized, that lets you know that where you are investing your money, that this is good soil. I've come to welcome you, first of all, to South Cleveland because you've chosen a good place to be. I believe that, and I am so thankful that you're a part of us here at South Cleveland. If this is your first time with us, we invite you to connect with us. There is a connect card on the pew in front of you. We ask you to take that out, fill it out. You can turn it in the offering containers as they come by in just a moment, or you can bring it back to our hospitality room where we want to welcome you and put a name with a face. We look forward to putting you in a church family. You are not called to live life alone. And if you have been coming for any amount of time and have not gotten connected, please let us do that. You were meant to be um, full of life and use your giftings and your purpose in a church family. So if you're not doing that, please come see me. We will connect you and we will get you producing life out of you as well. We are so thankful for your continued giving and your continued generosity. Uh, we are so thankful that we have the ability to transition quickly in different kind of means. Um, even when COVID arises, that we can move quickly back and forth into the parking lot. We had over, I think, 115 people down there and I think about 30 watching online. And then we have the ability to come into the sanctuary and, and do different ministries here. But our giving is also the same. You can give however is comfortable for your family. You can give online at southcleveland.org. You can text to give. 423-207-1043 or you can give in the containers as they come by. You can even mail your tithe. I have people that stop and drop it off. But be faithful with your giving. A few weeks ago I talked to you about when we went on our fishing trip and the captain uh, treated us like we didn't know what we were doing. Well, we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> we just needed someone to teach us and to train us and to be kind and patient with us. To just put it in simplistic terms because I had a heart to do and to, to catch some fish, but I didn't have the comprehension to do that. And the Lord talked to me and he said, Don, we do the same thing with our giving. We just expect people when they come in as newcomers to just understand, but they don't. 
Give them um, your wisdom. Give them your understanding and be patient. Teach them in simplistic terms. So when we ask you to give, it is not so that we can have more and contain more here. It is so that the Lord it would posture you for a blessing on your household. God is a respecter of his word, not a person's. It doesn't matter how much that you have to give, but as long as you are faithful with your giving. The first thing that your giving does is it tells us who you honor. No one likes to be disrespected, and we certainly don't want, don't want to disrespect God in our attitude. The first thing that we do with our giving is it says, God, I honor you. I know that everything I have is a gift from you. And the second thing that giving does is that it causes our heart to be closer to him. I want to be closer to him. Do you? There's a scripture that says, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. And where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Whatever you invest your time and your money and your energy, that's where your focus is. That's where you think is important. Whether it be in a new business venture, whether it be in your hobby, whether it be golfing or whatever you spend your time and your energy into, that's what says you say is important in your life. What does your giving say about your relationship with the Lord? Is it important to you? I heard someone say this week, you know, when I want God to bless a certain area of my life, I need him to draw close in that area. So I plant a seed of giving for it. Sometimes you'll see people when they give on their, on their note of their tithe or on their check, it'll say a seed, a seed for this, a seed for something else. I have something in my life that I need the Lord to bless and I need him to draw close to. And therefore, I'm giving a special offering above my normal tithe and offering because I say, God, this is important, but I'm not gonna be able to accomplish it without your help. So when you give this morning, take out your tithe envelope, if you've never been a tither, trust him. The Bible says you can prove him in this area. Nowhere else will you find that where God says, prove me. But he will prove himself when you are generous with what you have. Doesn't matter how much you have as long as you are faithful. A tithe means just 10%. That's all it means. And what it means is the first. We give it to him on the first day of the week with our first 10%. And it says, God, I honor you that I have this just because of you. But Lord, I'm here because I need you to draw closer to it. I need you to draw close to me. Would you take your tithe out this morning? You're giving. If you want, you can just name your seed because this is good soil. You're gonna hear on Wednesday night, I'm not sure if it's this Wednesday or the next Wednesday, Pastor Lance is gonna be talking about all the different missions that we give to. If you don't know, you are part of a very giving and generous church. Very. We don't get hoard it here. We give it away to multiply the kingdom. But come on that Wednesday night so that you can hear where some of your tithe dollars and your giving is going to because this is good soil. Would you take your tithe out and your giving? And we're going to put a blessing on it. Lord, I thank you so much for the ability, Lord, to gain wealth. Lord, I thank you for health in my body. Lord, I know that every good and perfect gift is from above. Lord, everything that I have is from you. And I thank you and I give you honor right now. Lord, me and my brothers and my sisters that are in this room, Lord, and online, I thank you, God, for what you have put in my hand. Lord, we recognize this morning, first and foremost, that it is a gift from you. Lord, I thank you that you can trust us. Lord, right now with our giving, with our 10% so that you can trust us with more. Lord, we will not hoard it, but God, we will give it back to you, a portion. Lord, so we will put ourselves in a position that you can put blessing upon blessing upon blessing because you can trust us with the amount that you've already given us. God, not only do we honor you and respect you with what you've given us, but God, we say, won't you draw closer? Lord, we put our money into a place that we care about. Lord, we care about you. We care about your presence. We care about this that you put in our hand. No, Lord, we're asking you to pour out a blessing, that which we cannot contain. Lord, you said shaken, pressed down, pushed together. Lord, with others given to us. Lord, we receive that blessing. But God, I know that you will cause us to give, to be abundant, to be a hilarious giver, because we know that every good and perfect gift is from you. We honor you and we ask you right now to pour your blessings out upon those in this household of faith as they are generous and as they are trustworthy with what you put in their hands. In your name we pray. Everyone said amen. You may take the containers on your left. Everyone underneath your left-hand pew, if you'll take it out from underneath you and put you can push it down or pass it down to the ones to the, to the next. Those in our safe space, they will come to you. Our ushers will come and receive the buckets on the other side. And again, we're so thankful. And we pray a humongous blessing on your household this week. Pastor Jim. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh, I exalt thee in every area of my life. Oh.
Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness, O oh God of heaven and earth. Let me just preach to you a few moments this morning. I want to talk to you on this thought, on this idea. It, it's not about what the day holds. Has anybody ever had a day that held trouble? Anybody ever had a day that held heartache, that held pain, that held disappointment, that, that held frustration? If you've lived any length of life, then you know what it is to face days that hold things that are less than to be desired. Surely I'm not the only one that's lived through days that held things that were less than to be desired desire. Well, I want you to hear me today. It's not really about what the day holds, but rather who holds the day. Mm. Mm. I I'm, I'm going to say that again. H half of you got it. The other half will get it in, in, in a moment. It it's not so important as to what the day holds, but, but what really matters is that you understand who holds the day. The little church that I grew up in at 1101 South Hall Street in Ennis, Texas, we would sing a song that said, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And, and so today, it's not so important what it is that the day holds, but what really matters is who holds the day? You, you and I should never be surprised when the days of our life hold trouble. You, you should never be surprised when the days of our lives. My, my, my wife laughed yesterday as someone was telling me about a difficulty, a heartache, a, a, a frustrating situation that they were going through. And I looked at them and I said to them what I've said to so many people over the last 18 months. I, 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 I responded to them with these words. These are the days of our lives. And, and, and I've, I've said that over and over again to people as, as they've come to me sharing with me their frustration, sharing with me their questions, sharing with me their doubts, sharing with me their heartache, I simply smile and, and shrug my shoulders and say, these are the days of our lives. And Peter writes in 1 Peter 4 and 12, and he says, Beloved, do not think it strange. I, I, I know you think we're living in strange days, I, I know you think we're experiencing strange circumstances. I, I know that, that what we call normal has been, has been knocked out of kill. But Peter says, even in moments like these, you should not think it strange concerning the fiery trial that tries you. As if some strange thing has happened to you. Peter said, when you are, when the day holds trouble, when the day holds heartache, when the day holds disappointment, when the day holds frustration, you should not be bewildered and act like some strange thing has happened to you. You see, I'm afraid that we in North America, we in the Western world, have, have heard the prosperity gospel preached to the point. That, 
that more of us than not think any time something goes wrong, any time something is difficult, any time something is hard, any time things don't go according to plan, it somehow means we have fallen out of favor with God. I'm afraid that the prosperity gospel has been preached to the point that many people in Christendom today think that if everything is not golden, that it means God has forsaken us, that God has let us down, that God has disappointed. Peter said, you should not think it's strange when difficulty comes. So listen today, if the enemy of your soul has has been telling you if God loved you, this wouldn't be happening. If the enemy of your soul has been telling you if God cared for you, you wouldn't be walking through this valley. Let me encourage you with some scriptures this morning that, that speak against that. If, if you feel like the, 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 the fiery trial that you're going through is a sign that God has forsaken you, if you feel like that if, if trouble is a part of your life that God's anointing is not with you, let me just remind you what the Bible says. The Bible says it rains on the just. Somebody help me. And it rains on the unjust. The Bible said everybody has need of an umbrella because everybody's going to get rained on. If you believe that's the word of the Lord, shout amen. The, the, the Bible, I, I, I don't know what TV preacher you've been listening to, but, but the Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, not of the heathen. Not of the ungodly, not of those who who displease God. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Job said it this way. Job said, man who is born of woman is a few days. And those days have a way of being filled with trouble. Listen, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial. Don't think it's strange concerning the affliction. Don't think it's strange concerning the trouble. Listen to me. What do you do when you're facing a day that holds difficulty that you did not want to walk through and that day seems to last longer than you ever dreamed it would have? Has anybody ever had a day that would never end? Does anybody feel like you're living in a day right now? That will never end, I promise you. 18 months ago, when I pulled my F-150 in the middle of that pavilion out there, in the middle of that portache, in the middle of that pull-through, and I climbed up in the back of it, and I preached from the bed of a pickup truck. I've been preaching this gospel for 30 years. It was the first time that I'd ever stood flat-footed in an F-150 and declared, ain't God good. And and I I promise you that when I climbed up in that F-150 18 months ago and and preached to a bunch of people sitting in cars honking the horns like crazy people, I promise you that if you'd have asked me then, would I be preaching in the ministry center parking lot to 100 people sitting in cars 18 months later, I'd have told you, I hope not. But this morning at 8, I thought 8.30, but 9.30, I I, I was standing in a parking lot preaching preaching to people in cars. And here's the question that I'm asking you. What do you do when a day holds trouble and the day lasts longer than you thought it was going to? How do we process our life? How do we process our existence? How do we process our relationship with God when we have unexpected trouble and that trouble lasts longer than we expected it to? Here's what the Bible says. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Peter writes, and he said, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Now, I want you to hear that scripture. That's verse 8. I'll preach verse 9 in a moment, but I want you to hear that scripture and hear it well. Peter writes, and he said, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Now, most of us know that these verses are speaking to end time events. 
chance. Now let me just stop right there and ask you, how many people still believe that there is going to be a rapture? There is going to be a catching away of the saints to meet the Lord in the air. Does anybody in this place still believe that King Jesus is coming back to earth again? I wish you'd act like you believe it today. I still believe that there is going to be a rapture. Now, I know people get, get tired of hearing that idea that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. Listen, they want to take the Bible and they want to use it as seven steps to a better you now, but they don't want to believe the Bible literally. Listen, I still believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and that it is profitable for reproof, doctrine, correction, in instruction and righteousness that the people of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And the Bible contains the doctrine of a catching away. And I'm telling you today, Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth again. Somebody clap your hands. Come on, come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. Don't, don't be don't be, don't be so archaic. Don't, don't be an old dinosaur. Get with the times. Your daddy believed that, and, and your grandfather believed that, and, and your great-grandfather believed that. Listen to me. If you have adopted the mentality that says your daddy believed that, your granddaddy believed that, and your great-grandfather believed that, you had better be careful this morning that you do not allow yourself to join the masses that are becoming the fulfillment of Peter's words because just a few verses before our text, Peter says this in 2 Peter 3 and 3. He said, know this, in the last days scoffers will come, mockers will come, saying where is the promise of his coming? Now, I don't know about you, but I promise you this. Edwin Lipsy has made up his mind that I will not join the wide way, the broad gate that leads to destruction that says where is the promise of his coming? But to Today, I still believe that the clouds are going to unfold, preparing his coming, and the stars will applaud him with thunders of praise. The sweet light in his eyes shall enhance those awaiting, and we shall behold him. Listen, the fivefold gospel concludes with he's my soon coming king. He's savior, healer, sanctifier, Holy Ghost baptizer, and soon coming king. That, that is the fivefold gospel. He, he is my savior. He is my healer. He is my sanctifier. He is my Holy Ghost baptizer. And so many in the church have stopped there. In this modern day, and want to leave out the, the, the climax of this thing, want to leave out the pinnacle of our encounters with Him. He is our soon coming King. Ah, the church used to preach it, and we used to sing songs that said, Oh, I want to see Him. Look up on his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. We used to sing, I believe he's coming back to earth again. I believe he's coming back to earth again. In the twinkling of an eye, he's going to split the eastern sky. And I believe he's coming back to earth again. You better hear this preacher. Paul writes to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and he says, I do not want you to be ignorant or uninformed concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so we believe that when he returns he shall bring with him all those who have fallen asleep. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain shall shall by no means prevent nor precede them that have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a 
shout with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which I wish somebody would act like you believe he's coming. Ah. Now, 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 this scripture is speaking to the end times. But, 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 but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to preach on the end times. I, I just want us to hear this scripture and hear what it's saying to us in this day and in this age in which we are living. I want you to hear what the scripture says to us today. Listen, listen to the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, to the Lord, a day is as a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. Here's my question for you. What do you do? How do you process your life, your existence, your relationship with God when unexpected trouble comes and it stays longer than you want it to? Uh, you've got to remember this, that a day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years as a day, and then here comes the good. Everybody say, give me the good news. Here comes the good news. The Lord is the next, it's the very next verse. It's the, it's, verse 8. A day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Verse 9. The Lord is not slack. You ever, you ever been in covenant with somebody that was slack? Slack, slack people get on my nerves. For the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. As men count slackness. But he is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, now let's just speak to the, to the original intent of that scripture for a moment and then get to where I'm going today. If you, if you want to know what the Lord is waiting on before he comes, the, the entire discourse, starting from verse 3, knowing that scoffers and mockers will come saying, where is the promise of his coming? To verse 8, where it says a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Verse 9 gives the reason that the Lord is waiting because he is not slack concerning his promises as men count slackness. Listen to this not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, the reason the rapture didn't take place before July the 12th, 1989, is because I was lost and undone without God and His Son, and God was waiting on me to come home, and God was waiting on you to come home. But know this, the day of the Lord will come gonna happen but what do you do when days last a long time you remember that a long day does not change his faithfulness a, a day may seem as though a thousand years but when a day seems as though a thousand years God is still not slack concerning his promises. See, here's, here's a problem in the church. We, we read the narratives of Scripture. We, we hear the preacher preach the iconic stories of the Bible. Now, I, there, 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 are, there are hidden gems and then there are iconic stories of the Scripture. And, and when we hear these iconic stories of the Scripture, 
I'm afraid that most times we, we, we fail to realize that they took days and weeks and months and years and decades to develop. We, we hear the story, we hear of the deliverance, we hear of the miracle, and we just have this idea that it is instantaneous. When in truth, most of them took time. I've got a, I've got a new gentleman in the 180 Center named Jordan. He's from Dallas, Texas, and he's a tremendous artist. He asked me, could he, could he make a lo new logo for the 180 Center? And I said, get after it. And he, he has drawn a logo where he takes the number 180, and the 8 is an hourglass. One, an eight that looks like an hourglass, zero, 180 center, and then he's got the caption under it, it takes time. One eighty. Now, now I know some people want to go to a recovery program that lasts two weeks with a couple two-day follow-ups. I got news for you. When, when you got 50 years of addiction in your life, when, when you got 42 years of learned behaviors in your life, most times, two weeks and a couple two-day follow-ups don't fix it. It takes time. Everybody say it takes time. Well, now, wait a minute, Brother Lipsy. Well, I, I, thought, I thought he who the sun sets free is free indeed. I thought of any man being Christ, he's a new creature. Old things were passed away and all things had become new. Listen, what God does, God does instantly. But most times it takes us a while to develop in it. It takes us a while to grow in it. And, and it, takes, it takes time. And, and because we hear the stories of Scripture without understanding the time that was involved, then when we go through a fiery trial and the day lasts longer than we expect it, we get discouraged. We want to quit. We want to give in. We want to give up. Let me give you a couple of examples and I'm going to let you go home today. I, I, I suppose probably my single favorite story in the scripture outside of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. My, my favorite story definitely in the Old Testament is found in Genesis 37 through 42. And those chapters tell the story about a young man named Joseph. Does anybody like the story of Joseph? I mean, what a comeback story. How many like a good comeback? Do you like a good comeback? And, and because we like a good comeback, we love the story of Joseph. Listen, you don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a person that went to Sunday school every time the doors were open to know the story of Joseph. All of you know what, what happened. You know that Joseph was given a coat of, somebody help me, a coat of many colors. That Joseph had the favor of his father. That Joseph had dreams about his brothers paying homage and his mom and dad paying homage. And that his brothers despised him because of his dreams. You all know the story that his brothers threw him into a pit and then sold him into slavery, that he went to Potiphar's house and was in charge of all that he had. Miss Potiphar lied on him and said that he tried to rape her and Joseph was thrown into prison. But even in the prison, Joseph found favor. Somebody shout it. We, we like that. And then became the prime minister of Egypt. But, but, but here's what you may not know. He wasn't in jail for a day. Hello? I mean, I mean, it seems like if God is just and something wrong happens to you, surely he's going to take care of it immediately. And, 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 and maybe you grew up hearing that story thinking, well, Joseph spent four days down there in the, in the dungeon. It, it, it was a little longer than that. J Joseph was 17 years old when Joseph was sold into slavery. Joseph was somewhere between 30 and 31 years old when he became prime minister of Egypt. That's 13 years. We, 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 don't, we don't know exactly how long he was in Potiphar's house, but most theologians believe he was in Potiphar's house about 18 months. 
Now, my math says that means he was in jail for 11 and a half years. Hello? What, what do you do when the day lasts longer than you thought it was going to last? What do you do when, when the trouble that you said God's going to set me free from? You, 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 you came to the altar and you were anointed with oil and, and the prayer of faith was prayed for you. And you said, God is going to set me free from that trouble. And six months later, you're still walking in that valley. What do you do? I tell you what you'd better do. You'd better remember this. A day may be as a thousand years and a thousand years may be as a day. It may take a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, but no matter how long it takes, I know this. He who holds tomorrow is faithful and if God said he'll do it, he'll do it. It doesn't matter how many times the sun rises and how many times. Listen, if you've got a son or a daughter that's addicted to alcohol and drugs and you've been praying God set them free and you've been pleading the blood of Jesus over their life and the sun rises and the sun sets and they're still in the crack house and the sun rises and the sun sets and they're still popping pills and the sun rises and the sun sets and the enemy of your soul says God is not going to do what God said he would do. I've got news for you. It doesn't matter if it's been a day, a week, a month, or a decade. If God said he's going to do it, you can take it to the bank because he, who has promised, is faithful. You can't. You, I, I didn't think I'd be preaching in a parking lot 18 months ago, today 18 months ago. I didn't think I'd be preaching to a third of the crowd that this building is nor normally used to hosting now, 18 months ago. What do you do when trouble lasts longer than you thought it would last? Tell you what you'd better do. You, you'd better say, no matter what I see, no matter what I hear, no matter what I feel, he who has promised is faithful. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. But no matter what takes place in my life, blessed be the name of the Lord. Listen to me. Sometimes it takes, it takes time. The prophet Samuel shows up at Jesse's house. Says God has rejected Saul. Saul has lost the favor of God. And David, you're the next king of Israel. Pour his anointing all over him. Blows the trumpet. Says, surely the Lord's hand is on him. We, we hear that. And, and if you don't read, if you don't study, you think David became king. The next 15 years after David was told by Samuel, you are the prince of Israel. The next 15 years was the most chaotic 15 years you'd ever seen in your life. He's running. He's hiding in caves. Saul's trying to kill him. Everything that can go wrong has gone wrong. He's, he, he's hoping God is going to send some people to his rescue. And the Bible says all those who were discontented, in debt, and disappointed came and gathered around him. That's not who he was looking for. He was looking for warriors. But he had 15 years of chaos from the time God said, you're the king, to the time a crown was put on his head. And, and, and even then, that was the crown of Judah. Took another seven years to get 22 years removed from the promise of God before the promise of God was fulfilled. Listen to me. If you have been believing for something and what you've been believing for is tearing. Don't you let the tearing of God's promise ever make you doubt the levity of God's promise. If God said he's going to do it, you can take it to the bank. The, Lord, the Bible said the eyes of the Lord watch over his word. 
to perform it. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. What do you do when the trouble the day holds doesn't seem to want to go away? What do you do when you hear preachers preach about being surrounded by the favor of God? Here's, here's how it may come at you. The Bible says, as the mountains surround Jerusalem. So the Lord surrounds those who fear Him. What, what do you do when you hear that scripture, when you hear a message preached about being surrounded by God? But, but then your day begins to unfold. And instead of being surrounded by God, you, you're surrounded by principalities powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. Instead of God's law of Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, you being the head, the, not the tail above and not beneath, blessed when you go in, blessed when you come out, Murphy's law is being, what do you do when you feel surrounded by the enemy instead of surrounded by God? Listen. Genesis chapter 7 tells the story of the flood. Righteous Noah saves his family alone. God shuts the door of the ark. The clouds gather. The thunder claps. The lightning flash. And the rain falls. S somebody tell me how long it lasts. That's the right answer. 40 days and 40 nights. But, but listen to me. When, when the thunder stopped clapping and the lightning stopped flashing and the rain stopped coming down in torrents, that things were not okay. Noah would slide the window of that ark open. He'd look. What was he looking at, Brother Lipsy? As far as he could see. Listen to me. Some 150 days after the storm had ended, as far far as he could see to the east, the west, the north, and the south. You, you know what he saw? Water, the results of the storm. The, the storm was over, but the storm's results surrounded Noah's life. And maybe that's where you are today. A storm blew into your life. I've got a friend named LaDonna Mills. She's sitting on a church pew right now in Houston, Texas. A storm blew into her life this year. And as a result of COVID-19, she buried her husband, one of my closest friends. Maybe a storm blew in your life and you lost somebody. There's, there's people listening to me preach right now and you, you know the agony. You know the frustration. You know the, the depth of hurt that comes with burying a son or a daughter. When, when storms come, that they blow in and they blow out. But oftentimes they leave us surrounded by their results. 
Maybe you went through a divorce. And today, every, all you can see, results of the storm. Maybe you went through a financial crisis. Today, all you can see, results of the storm. The, the Bible says this in Genesis chapter 8. It's probably one of the greatest most inspirational verses of the Bible. Genesis 8, verse 1. I, I venture to say nobody in here can just quote it. It's not one of the most quoted verses in the Bible. But oh, the power of this verse. And the Lord remembered Noah. And the Lord remembered Noah. And he sent a wind to begin to blow on the face of the waters. And the waters began to recede. And on the first day of the tenth month, the mountaintops became visible again. I, I, I've, I've got good news for you today, brothers and sisters. If your days that you've walked through recently and the day that you're walking through even now has held more trouble than you could have ever planned for and put you in a valley that has caused you to think you'll never see another mountain the way the Lord remembered Noah he says today, I remember you. And I prophesy to you today in the mighty name of Jesus that you're going to see mountaintops again. There, there are going to be sunrises. There's going to be joy. There's going to be peace. There's going to be hope. There's going to be renewal. There's going to be anticipation. There's going to be expectation. There's going to be receiving instead of walking in lack. You've got to remember this. It's not about what the day holds. It's about who holds the day. And this day, with all of its trouble, this day with all of its difficulty, this day with all of its turmoil, it may be beyond our president. It may be beyond our Congress. It may be beyond the help of any person you know. But this day, with all of its trouble, all of its uncertainty, all of its peril, is held in the hand of God. And here's what I know about him. He is not slack concerning his promises. But he is faithful. Debbie Moody, he will do what he has said he will do. Put your hope in would you slip your hands to heaven all over this house? Slip your hands. Mm. God, I thank you that you hold my life in the palm of your hand. God, I thank you that while this 
health crisis has lasted longer than any would have hoped and any would have planned. You still hold this day in the hollow of your hand. God, I trust you. You're, you're my redeemer. You're my sustainer. And when the trouble lasts longer than I think it ought to last, even then will I praise you. Even then will I worship you. Even then well, I say God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask, think, or even imagine according to his power that worketh in us. Now, Lord, I, I have no way to know every personal crisis that the families of this house are walking through. I, I know right now that the Gladson family is fighting a situation with COVID. I know that the Buckners are fighting a situation with COVID. I know that the SEALs are... I, I, I know that we have families that are affected right now. And, and that's their battle. And I ask you for grace sufficient for their days. God, the, while that crisis has gone on, People have still struggled with the things we've always struggled with in all of life. God, I just ask you for your help in our day of trouble. I ask you for your strength in our moment of weakness. And I ask you for your grace that is so sufficient to touch our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Here's what I want you to do right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I've done my best to give you the word of the Lord this morning. If you're here and you would say, Pastor, I am walking through a valley of trouble that it has lasted longer than I could have ever dreamed. And today I needed to be reminded that my God sees me, that my God hears me, and that my God reaches me and that even today in prolonged trouble I can be at peace knowing that he cares for me if that's you slip your hand up quickly hands going up all over the building I worship Lord sing us a song of worship it may look like I'm, I'm surrounded, surrounded, but I'm surrounded, surrounded by you. It, it may look like I'm surrounded, surrounded but I'm surrounded by you. you. Hey. It, it may look like I'm surrounded, surrounded but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, it may look like
slip your hands to heaven. Slip your hand. I'm going to pray for you right where you're at. Hands went up all over this house. Lord, the scripture says, even in the presence of our enemies, you'll prepare a table for us. And God, I ask you right now in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the heartache, that you would prepare tables before us. That we would taste and see that you are good. Heal our bodies. Renew our minds. Touch our marriages. Give financial breakthrough. Make ways where there seem to be none, oh God. And we will be forever careful to give you praise, to give you glory, and to give you honor. And win the miracle. Win deliverance. When restoration seems to tarry, we will not be distracted from this truth. You, you clothe the lilies of the field. You care for the birds of the air. And if you do that, surely you're watching over us. And our day shall come. For you, O oh Lord, are not slack concerning your promises. If you believe his promises are true, clap your hands and shout amen. We're going week to week with what we're doing with our service time. Next week, we will be 8.30 in the parking lot there, 10.30 in the sanctuary. Yeah, don't go to that parking lot at 8.30. Nobody's down there. I was down there this morning. 9.30 in the parking lot. 9.30 in the parking lot down there. 10.30 here. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and give you peace. May he grant you the desires of your heart and make all of your plans to succeed in the glorious name of Jesus. God bless you and keep you as you go. Sing them out. Oh,